President Doll, dear Prime Minister Blankovic, dear EPP friends, dear watchers of this live stream, Dobro jutro i dobro došli. Good morning and welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the local dialogue of the EPP group in the European Committee of the Regions here in Zagreb, the beautiful, the very beautiful capital of Croatia. As you know, our event this morning is taking place in the framework of the EPP Congress. Before giving the floor to the EPP President, Joseph Doll, for his opening remarks, I would like to use this chance here to express our sincere gratitude for the close cooperation and for the productive partnership between the EPP party and the EPP group in the COR over the past years. President Joseph Doll, dear Joseph, I would like to thank especially you for your strong leadership in keeping the EPP family united and for your firm commitment to the values of freedom, subsidiarity, and solidarity. <laughs> Dear Joseph, I know that you're in a hurry today. You have a lot of, uh, a lot of appointments, so I give the floor directly to you now. Thank you. Cher Premier Ministre André Plenkovic, cher Président Schneider, je salue tous les commissaires que je n'ai pas vus, ce qui fait sombre dans la salle. Cher Président, cher Vice-président, chers membres du groupe PPE au Comité des Régions, mais aussi chers collègues maires, chers intervenants, chers amis. C'est un plaisir pour moi de participer à l'ouverture de cet événement organisé dans le cadre des dialogues locaux du PPE par notre groupe au Comité des Régions, en partenaire avec HTC. Je voudrais tout d'abord vous remercier pour cette excellente initiative lancée en mars 2018, qui a joué un rôle important dans notre campagne pour les élections européennes. Et en organisant aux quatre coins d'Europe les débats sur les thèmes chers aux Européens, vous avez fait honneur à votre mission d'amener l'Europe au plus près de ses citoyens, de renouer le dialogue avec eux de leur offrir des solutions claires aux problèmes qu'ils rencontrent dans leur vie de tous les jours, vous le savez, je vous ai toujours soutenu dans cette importante mission. Alors que je quitte la présidence du PPE, je suis heureux de pouvoir me, vous confier et de dire que notre ami Donald Tusk continuera à vous écouter et à vous épauler. Mes amis, comme toujours, vous avez choisi un sujet des plus actuels et pertinents les investissements européens dans nos régions et dans nos villes. Car contrairement à ceux qui croient que c'est aux États et aux institutions européennes de créer des emplois de et croissance, nous savons que cela est le rôle des entreprises. Les décideurs politiques doivent se limiter à créer les conditions idéales pour que ces dernières puissent se développer et prospérer, ce qui signifie les libérer des contraintes administratives, créer des conditions de concurrence équitables au niveau international et bien évidemment favoriser aussi les investissements. Lorsqu'on parle d'investissement, nos pensées vont immédiatement au plan Juncker. Vous vous souviendrez que lors de son lancement par le vice-président Katainen, les critiques affirmaient qu'il n'atteindrait jamais l'objectif initial des 315 milliards d'euros d'investissement mobilisés. Eh bien, aujourd'hui, nous sommes déjà à 440 milliards qui ont profité à plus d'un million de PME. Et ce chiffre est destiné à croître dans les prochaines années. Tout comme le nombre d'emplois créés au projet sponsorisé par l'EFSI, déjà 1,1 million à ce jour, chacune de nos villes et de vos régions a, a vu très concrètement cet impact. Et grâce aussi au plan Juncker, plus de 500 000 logements abordables ont été construits ou rénovés. 33 millions d'Européens bénéficient d'un meilleur système de traitement des déchets. 182 millions de vos concitoyens peuvent profiter des transports urbains et ferroviaires plus performants et durables. 8 millions de lignes à très haut débit ont été activées. 
Rien qu'en Croatie, mon cher Premier ministre, les projets EFSI devraient mobiliser plus d'un milliard d'euros en investissement. Et parmi les bénéficiaires, on retrouve des PME innovantes comme Rimac Automobili, qui développe les technologies de pointe pour les voitures électriques, ou la compagnie électrique HEP, qui va construire de nouvelles centrales électriques plus vertes ici à Zagreb. Voici, mes amis, quelques exemples concrets comment nous pouvons, lorsque nous nous donnons les moyens, améliorer le quotidien des Européens. Cela, vous devriez le rappeler à vos concitoyens pour leur montrer que l'Europe est là, qu'elle est présente et qu'elle se préoccupe de leur avenir. Aussi, pour continuer à assurer cette mission, nous devons nous doter d'un budget européen à la hauteur, ambitieux et tourné vers l'avenir, qui investisse dans notre plus grande richesse, les personnes. Si nous sommes ici à parler de cela, ce n'est certainement pas de notre faute. Nous étions prêts, le PPE, depuis longtemps. Dès 2017, le PPE avait lancé son groupe de travail sur le cadre financier qui avait débouché sur l'adoption en janvier 2018 de nos priorités pour le budget post-2020. Malheureusement, certains pays, dont le mien, ont fait blocage au Conseil européen. Dans l'optique devenue hélas courante de tout changer sans savoir comment et dans l'illusion de pouvoir retourner la table par la suite, ils ont empêché les négociations d'aboutir avant les élections européennes. Et maintenant, nous nous retrouvons à l'aube de 2020 sans aucune visibilité pour le futur. Cela ne doit pas continuer. Nos communautés locales et régionales, nos entreprises, nos concitoyens ont besoin de clarté, de stabilité pour prendre leurs décisions pour l'avenir. Les fonds européens ne profitent tant de nos étudiants, chercheurs, agriculteurs, ne peuvent plus rester bloqués par des intérêts partisans. Il est donc crucial que les négociations avancent très vite. L'Europe doit se doter le plus, le plus tôt possible d'un budget qui lui permette de poursuivre les politiques qui ont permis d'améliorer la vie des Européens, comme la politique agricole qui m'est très chère, ainsi que la politique de cohésion, tout en, 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 en anticipant les défis du futur. Chaque euro doit être dépensé de façon responsable et faire réellement la différence pour nos concitoyens en assurant leur avenir. Dans tout cela, mes amis, vous avez un rôle clé à jouer, car les élus locaux et régionaux sont la clé de voûte de nos politiques. Personne ne connaît mieux que vous, vos concitoyens, les réalités locales, les besoins de vos communautés, et c'est à vous de partager cette connaissance afin que l'on puisse investir de manière ciblée et efficace à vous de proposer les projets prioritaires, à vous de faire découvrir les projets financés par l'Europe. Je vous lance donc encore une fois un défi, comme d'habitude. Chaque jour, dites quelque chose de positif sur l'Union européenne pour constater le bruit constant fait par les populistes avec leurs slogans vides. C'est comme cela que nous pourrons renouer le dialogue avec les citoyens, restaurer leur confiance dans l'Europe. Car, mes amis, si le mandat de président du PPE m'a donné beaucoup de satisfaction, c'est celui de maire qui restera à jamais gravé dans mon cœur. Ce sont nos maires, nos élus locaux, nos élus régionaux qui feront avancer cette Europe que nous aimons dans chaque village et dans chaque ville et qui feront en sorte que nos concitoyens tombent à nouveau amoureux du projet européen. Et c'est comme ça que nous allons assurer notre pérennité et aussi continuer les 70 années de paix que nous avons passées. C'est ce que je vous souhaite. Merci beaucoup de m'avoir écouté. Dear President Doyle, dear Joseph, thank you very much for your words, for your intervention here in our, uh, in our uh, local dialogue. And once again, thank you very much for all your support to the group of the EPP in the COR in the last years. I think the fact that you have been a mayor yourself makes it more and, and, and better understandable, uh, your commitment in our cooperation. Uh, I wish you, on behalf of all our colleagues, all the EPP uh, regional and, and local politicians, I wish you all the best for your future and for today, a very success, successful Congress. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Postovani uh, Prime Minister Plenkovic, dear Prime Minister Plenkovic, I would uh, also like to warmly welcome you to our EPP COR local dialogue. 
I express my deepest gratitude to you and our friends from the Croatian Democratic Union, HDZ, for the warm hospitality that you have shown to us, that you are showing to us, to us members of the EPP group, without your commitment, with, without your support, this dialogue would not have been possible and our presence here today in this way would not have been possible. Dear um, Prime Minister Blankovic, I give the floor to you in a hurry because I know that you are also in a hurry. You also have, of course, a lot of appointments today. So please, the floor is yours. Dear President Schneider, Cher Joseph, Draghi Nikola, Poštovani Ministre Malenica, dear friends, it is really a pleasure for me to welcome you in Zagreb uh, in the framework of the 26th Congress of European People's Party with this dialogue that the EPP group in the Committee of the Regions is organizing here today. The Committee of the Regions is one of the very important European institutions. We respect the work that you do. We respect the voice that comes from the local and regional governments. We respect the message that you send every day in your endeavors to try to make Europe tangible to the every single village, city, or region in Europe. This is your added value. This is what you stand for. And this is where we, from the levels of the national governments, are here to support you. Croatia has in past a little bit more than three years, while I have the honor to enjoy the confidence of the Croatian voters as the Prime Minister, insisted on improving the concept of decentralization. We are the government that has established the dynamics and the intensity of the dialogue with our counties, and here especially Nikola, who is not only leading the Croatian uh, group of the EPP within the Committee of the Regions since 2013, but is one of our most experienced and the long-standing prefects of the Dubrovnik Neretva County, very much understands that no other Croatian government has been so dynamic and so open in coordinating the national priorities with the strategic projects in all parts of Croatia. We have made considerable efforts in improving the functional decentralization. That is to say, we have given more powers, more competencies to counties. On the 1st of January, under the leadership of Minister Malenica, we shall complete the merger of the offices of the state administration with the counties, thus giving more power and more responsibilities to those who are elected within the principle of subsidiarity the closest, in the closest manner to their fellow citizens. We have also made substantial steps in improving the fiscal decentralization. So we have not only intensified the dialogue, given more powers and more work to do, but we have given the means to the counties, cities and villages much more than any Croatian government before. Only last two years, more than three billion kunas have been left for the work and the projects of the counties cities and villages. At the same time, we are a facilitator for the local authorities to use the biggest power of the investment in my country, and that is important to remember, that 80% of public investments actually comes from the absorption of the European Union funds. These 80% are many times operated and the final beneficiaries are the regions and the cities in Croatia. That's why this comprehensive approach that we have established is making fruits in attaining the main objective of the balanced regional development of all parts of our country. That simply embodies the policy of the cohesion, one of the two traditional EU policies that many of the countries, especially still from Central and Eastern Europe, and we as the latest member of the Union want to accentuate also within the next multi-annual financial framework. What I would also like to mention that everything that we are doing from a public or European point of view, it should be oriented towards incentivizing 
the investments of the private sector. Uh, that's why the EFSI that was mentioned by uh, Joseph is important for a, for a balanced and more dynamic economic growth across Europe. I am uh, really happy that you will have uh, debates today and that Nicola and other colleagues who are here, I know there are more Croatian uh, prefects and mayors uh, than usual at this type of event, will get familiar with the works and the substance of our European political family, and that is the EPP. My big appreciation, once again, to everything that Joseph has done for us as president over the last six years, but also previously in his entire political work. Merci beaucoup, Joseph, and I wish you a very good stay in Croatia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Blankovic, for your words and for your having been here. And now, dear friends, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome a guest who's not in the program, but who I'm very happy to welcome for a short intervention. It's the uh, Secretary General of our EPP party, Antonio Lopez. We have... We have many reasons for gratitude towards him because in the last years it was also him who was willing to, uh, to, to cooperate with us and to, to take on board our proposals and our, our uh, initiatives. So I welcome you with, with great pleasure. You are running today again for the post of Secretary General and I can uh, say that my support you have and I'm sure you will also have the support of my colleagues. So please, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, I guess I'm not going to mention everybody because I, it's very dark here, so I cannot see you well. In any case, of course, I saw my good friend and uh, our Prime Minister in Croatia, Andrei Plenković, uh, President of the EPP, Joseph Dol. I saw also coming another member of the Presidency of the EPP, the Mayor of Warsaw, Rafael Traskowski, who's here with, also with us. And uh, you know, uh, Mih Mihal said that uh, what a pleasure for me is to be with you and that you are in the Congress of DPP. It's a long time since I became Secretary General and tell you the truth, the group of the Committee of the Regions, the DPP group in the Committee of the Regions did not have this kind of coordination with the party. So it's an honor that you are here. And it's very important for all of us. You know I have told you and we have made the bed from the party. Also, uh, Joseph, who is an expert in local politics, also uh, told us to work in this sense. Uh, local politics is everything. Uh, European politicians, we are called bureaucrats, we are far away, we are in Brussels, in the bubble, and you are the ones that you are next to the people. For the good and for the bad, you receive your critics, uh, you are also praised but uh, you are the ones that can speak about Europe to the people. That sometimes as some, us, members of the European Parliament, we cannot do in the same sense. There are so, so, some of us that we are much more dedicated to this and others not so. So it's your effort that really helps us. I think that uh, still we have not done enough. I think that the group of DPP in the Committee of the Regions has to be the representation of the group in the Committee of the Regions has to be uh, enhanced inside the EPP. And I'm talking with Mihail and uh, your good Secretary General, uh, Heinz uh, Knapp, uh, to uh, improve also the collaboration and the presence. For also, for that, we need you not only to elaborate on re resolutions for the Committee of the Regions, of course, but also for us, for the EPP. Uh, today we are discussing about climate change, about Western Balkans, about many things. But we need also your ideas and your inputs about local politics, what we all call real politics. 
in your towns, in your cities, in your regions, is where policy is made. I'm a firm believer in subsidiarity, although I would like to change the world. Because when I speak about subsidiarity, no one understands me. And I think it happens to you also. What we need is to find the real world that means that you are, you are the bridge between Brussels and what's being in Brussels and local politics. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm optimistic. Things are going well, not enough. For that I have Michael Snyder always remember me. This uh, in haste also cooperation that we have to work on. And uh, just to tell you how grateful we are that you are all here, that you did an effort because you are in the day-to-day -day politics and it's not easy for you to come to Zagreb, but uh, it's uh, very important. Ah, <laughs> thank you. They're also telling me that a very dear friend who has just won the mayorship of Sofia, Fanda Kova, is here with us also. And I'm very... <laughs> Tough, tough election that she won. Uh, very tough, I know that, I know that. Uh, against all odds, so we are very proud uh, of this victory uh, in Sofia. Thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, it's not about also your politics, but also national politics. Your parties are improving in many European countries, but we have still much work ahead. Thank you, thank you for coming. And uh, next time will be, Michal will be in, uh, in Brussels, that I will go there to see that the promises are made. Thank you. Yes, Honor, thank you very much. We have it on record now, what you said, and we will use it in the future. Thanks a lot. And I uh, can only underline what you said. Uh, the regional and local politicians, we always say that, we, we always uh, repeat that they are the closest to the citizens. If we want to reconnect the Re European Union with the European citizens, we need the, in, the engagement, the involvement of the uh, regional, of the local politicians, especially of EPP. And the strength of EPP local politicians is proved today by the presence of two mayors already mentioned, uh, um, Mrs. Fandakova and Mr. Chaskovsky, two mayors from European capitals who won the, the elections against all uh, the difficulties that are in this, this big city. So congratulations for your success. Thank you that you are also here today. And Tono, I wish you uh, success in, in the election. Fr dear friends, I will now give the floor and the microphone to the moderator of our panels today, uh, not without repeating my gratitude, my thanks to the Croatian delegation in the EPP group of the Committee of the Regions under the uh, uh, leadership of Nikola Dobroslavic. Ni Nikola Dobroslavic, my very good friend. We have been working together since many years now. The, you were the first Croatian EPP politician that I met in the Committee of the Regions when you came as observer before the accession of Croatia. So now uh, you will have the floor. You will moderate uh, the, the two panels that we have today. I thank very much uh, uh, all the participants of these panels. It's very, very uh, helpful for us and it's of great worth for us, for our work, and I think we will have a very good dialogue today here this morning. Thank you very much, Nicola. HDZ predvodi većinu u Hrvatskom parlamentu, u Saboru. Predsjednik vlade, kao što znate, i vlada je HDZ-ova i većina od 
svih regija, županija, gradova i općina dolazi iz HDZ-a. Mi ćemo danas imati ovdje dva panela. Oni će trajati po 30 minuta. Nadam se da ćemo se moći držati toga vremena, jer nakon panela u 11.45 imamo drugi dio našeg programa. Naš domaćin, kolega Željko Turk, organizirao je studijski posjet Zaprešić u jednoj tvornici. Tamo će biti jedan lagalni ručak. Moramo biti jako točni, kratki u izlaganjima da stignemo u 11.45 doći do autobusa. Pozivam vas također da budete korist, da koristite društvene mreže. Tamo ćete vidjeti hashtag na koji se možete pozvati. Evo, u svakom slučaju krenimo sa prvim panelom koji smo nazvali bolje povezivanje Europske unije i građana, traženje učinkovitih rješenja zajedno s regijama i gradovima. Za ovu važnu temu imamo tri uvažena panelista koje ću predstaviti i zamoliti ih da dođu i sjednu za ove stolce koje smo ovdje priredili. To je Rafal Časkovski, gradonačelnik Varšave i podpredsjednik Evropske pučke stranke. Dobar dan. Dobro. Hvala. Naš drugi sugovornik bit će Marku Markula, predsjednik regije Helsinki i prvi podpredsjednik Evropskog odbora regija. Marku, welcome. Thank you. I treća predstavnica bit će Deidr Ford, vječnica grada Korka. Podsjećam dakle na potrebu kratkoće odgovora, ja ću također nastojati biti kratak. Gospodine Časkovski, od prošle godine ste gradonačelnik Varšave. Veliko nam je zadovoljstvo da je skupina Evropske pučke stranke u odboru regija također pridonjela vašem uspjehu na izborima. Kako ste u neprijateljskoj kampanji prema vama, i ozračju hladnih odnosa Brisela i vaše vlade uspjeli ostvariti tako izvarednu pobjedu. Hvala lijepo, kako ste dobro. Pozdrav za sve. Želim vam uspjehov. I will switch into English. Yes, I mean it was a very difficult campaign and it wasn't easy to win it. The important thing was to be close to the people. Okay, everybody knows that this is a slogan, this is a cliche, but what does it really mean? It means that you have to speak a different language to different people. Warsaw is a pretty big city, two million inhabitants, 18 districts. And what we decided to do, I mean, we decided really to uh, have a very long pre-campaign and then uh, the campaign, the actual campaign. It took us more than 10 months. And I was everywhere. I was in every district. I listened to the people and I decided to create a program by talking to them. And therefore, we discovered that uh, different districts have different preoccupations. I mean, in Warsaw, there are quite a lot of differences, as in every big city. I mean, if, for example, you look at the uh, expectancy uh, of uh, living, of, of, of life in the uh, poorest district of Warsaw, that's for a male 68 years old. In the richest, it's 82. I mean, the difference of 14 years, it's, it's really incredible which means that you really have to address completely different problems when you are in the districts which are relatively rich, which are well communicated with the city center when it comes to public transportation. Uh, there you talk about uh, quality of air, you talk about uh, quality of life in general, access to preschools and so on and so forth. And of course in those uh, districts which are a bit run down, you talk about different preoccupations. For example, uh, actually uh, contacting the houses or you know doing networking with 
the central heating systems, because this is the problem. You have to simply connect some of the apartments which are not connected to the heating system. And then you also employ a different language, but most importantly, you are on the streets all the time, talking to people. And I remember that you know uh, the, the press was not happy because we didn't do huge billboards, and we were attacked by the government, you know, who uh, owns this four channels of public TV, churns out propaganda all the time. Uh, people were complaining, you know, the, the the pundits were complaining that I'm not visible, but I was there, and I was there with the people on the streets. And at the end of the day, it really proved uh, to be a winning strategy because I was elected in the first round with almost 57% of the vote that no one expected. Because at the end of the day, if you're close to the people, if you really react to what they want uh, you to do, if you earn your credibility, then there is a possibility of winning it. And the last thing I want to tell you, what we started with was a program for women. Uh, we started talking about empowering women, really uh, uh, introducing a change in which chances would be equal. But it wasn't just a slogan. What we did, we promised free preschools. Uh, and uh, and that's what we've done. I mean, in a year, we were able to double the number of places in preschools in Warsaw to 13,000, and they're no, now all for free. Uh, we built preschools, but we also ask entrepreneurs to create those places so that uh, women can actually uh, have a place where they can uh, leave their kids and, and then uh, perfect their abilities, work, and so on and so forth. And also, other points of that program, uh, which uh, were about health, which were about equal chances, which were about equal pay. And it turned out to be really important because uh, women voted for me. I mean, 10% more women voted for me than men. So I mean, if you really attack concrete prob problems and then when you earn your credibility, you can win even against the machinery of the state when it's used against you as it was in Warsaw. Fala. Hvala i čestitke još jednom, kolega Markula. Čiste i niskougljične inovacije predstavljaju jedan od prioriteta finskog predsjedanja koje je u tijeku, a isto tako i za Evropsku pučku stranku. Stoga ciljamo k obliku mobilnosti koji je održiv, energetski učinkovit i čuva okoliš. Mnoge nove tehnologije brzo napreduju da bi to omogućile. Možete li dati primjer realističnog rješenja koje bi nova komisija mogla stvoriti u partnerstvu s regijama i gradovima, a što bi bio odgovor na klimatske promjene. Kako predsjednici regija, gradonačelnici i načelnici mogu bolje surađivati s poslovnim sektorom i istraživačima s evropskih sveučilišta? Uh, but let me first stress that uh, everywhere this is uh, uh, very much the local issue, but then we need to think globally as well. I was just uh, a week ago uh, one of the hosts of the Globe Energy Award uh, uh, big, big uh, final ceremonies in my city, Espo, the western part of Helsinki region, where we had uh, award winners from all around the world. And that showed that locally uh, people can do much more. Most cases it was together with the uh, industry, large and small, together with the some universities or in many cases children, different ages of children from schools. They take good care. We had a good uh, example of uh, uh, the eastern uh, Indonesia, Papua area where the use of solar panels had created the huge opportunities for local children actually to go to school, organize the school in a new way, be connected globally, and uh, let's say enjoy the life. So the well-being of citizens needs to be very, very high on that. Another example there from my own city was really the collaboration between city, uh, universities, and especially industry because we cannot, uh, the public sector, we cannot do the changes alone. We need to work very much with the industry. We showcase with three companies uh, and then the public uh, municipality water system uh, provider. So what can be done when we work in good collaboration? Create uh, joint action plans as in our case, uh, uh, Helsinki region, 
uh, the whole region is very well covered by district heating today, uh, but we need to get rid of using coal, so moving to carbon neutrality. Several cities, my city is included, we have put already the target to be carbon neutral much, much earlier than we in general request uh, based on the Paris Agreement. We want to be carbon neutral by 2030. And one important step uh, on that is uh, already six years from now, so 2025, uh, we are uh, uh, not anymore using coal in our district heating. Instead, we have uh, one very uh, challenging technology initiative by the private sector, uh, making a six kilometer deep hole, or actually two holes on the ground geothermal, and providing 10% of our whole energy uh, for the district heating of the city. Then we have, uh, of course, heat pumps. Uh, we uh, have just uh, constructing by the company Fortum. We are uh, creating the, the uh, biofuel power stations. We are taking heat out of the water. Water system is essential on that. We are taking heat, uh, the energy out of the data centers and so on. So there's many parallel activities and all of in all of those. So we need uh, as well uh, the city, but uh, strong uh, support from the citizens that we are uh, kind of creating a, a, a joint uh, energy grid system, measuring systems, we can all do our things. So what I can only say with the strongly on this so that the the Europe of the future is, is really Europe of citizens. And that means that everyone needs to be involved and we can share and we need to share our best practices. And that, from that perspective, the work of the Committee of the Regions is so crucial. So we collaborate more, we create more European partnerships and that's why cohesion financing and uh, collaboration based on that is so crucial. Thank you, Marco. Gospodjo Ford, vi ste dio vodeće generacije irskih političara. Koji su glavni politički prioriteti za Kork i gdje vidite potrebu da EU investicije pretvore prioritete u konkretne projekte? Kako surađujete s drugim evropskim gradovima? Hello to everybody here. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, we're very fortunate in Cork because our government under Leo Varadkar has recently determined that Cork is to be the fastest growing city in Ireland in the next 20 years. We intend to grow our city from 120 population to 340, and we will achieve that target. Uh, we want to build uh, instead of houses and neighbourhoods, we want to build homes and communities. We want to uh, build in the context of accelerated global uh, trends, such as urbanisation, digitalisation and uh, climate action, of course. So we're very well aware of the benefits of the EU, because in the last while, the EU has contributed significantly to the Cork area. In particular, we opened a bridge in Cork, which was par funded by the EU, and that, bond, uh, that uh, bridge um, was very relevant to the people on the ground. You know, when we talk about cohesion and subsidiarity and all that, uh, the man in the street or the woman in the street, it doesn't resonate with them. But a bridge that they can utilize every day does. So we're very grateful for the funding there. And we also got funding of th uh, 13 million for our Port of Cork, which is so important to us. And our educational institutions got a building fund of uh, substantial millions. Um, so we're very well aware of the benefits of the EU and working closely. Currently, we have 19 projects uh, in collaboration with our EU neighbors. And uh, we intend to build on that. It's networking as well. So we hope to give back what we get by interacting with our other countries so that it's, a bit, uh, it's in the business of collaboration and neighborliness rather than just taking and taking. Thank you. Thank you. Gospodine Chaskovsky, 
obnašali ste dužnosti zastupnika u Evropskom i nacionalnom parlamentu. Nadamo se da ćete se uskoro pridružiti nama u Evropskom odboru regija. S obzirom na vaše iskustvo na lokalnoj, nacionalnoj i evropskoj razini, kako mogu građani biti bolje upoznati o dodanoj vrijednosti i učinku Evropske unije na njihov svakodnevni život? Što još mogu učiniti regionalne i lokalne vlasti u tom smjeru? Well, yes, I mean, I, I was, I was uh, both in uh, national politics, Minister of European Affairs and D Digitization. You're right, I was also in European politics, a member of the European Parliament. Uh, and the important thing is that it's difficult to, uh, to make that link if, you do not, if you're not concrete enough. And now, all the challenges that cities face now uh, actually are the global challenges, or most of the global challenges that the Euro European Union faces and tries to tackle. For example, now in Warsaw, everyone talks about quality of life. What does that mean? It means uh, air quality and fighting climate change. And obviously, this is one of the biggest, uh, biggest um, challenges that is before the European Union. If we talk about integrating migrants, and we want, and this is, was my slogan, to make Warsaw an open city, a transparent city, this is also something that is tackled on the European level. I mean, those issues even though, uh, I mean, we would think normally about local politics that this is about congestion and, and, and waste management and so on and so forth. Yes, it is, but waste management is also regulated on the European level. So at the end of the day, you have to translate that into, uh, into concrete examples, that whatever we do in the cities, we need know-how, we need, as you said, to produce certain added value, and we can do it by exchanging uh, data by cooperating together, by creating common programs, by trying to access EU funds uh, together in order to change the reality. Because if we do not accept certain standards, certain values on the European level, on a national level, then it's very difficult to uh, fight them on a local level when it comes to, 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 to the challenges that I've just enumerated. And even sometimes, you know, we on the local level, the mayors of the cities, are sometimes at the forefront of, of change. We are much more progressive and much more ready to attack those challenges because there is no calculation. At the end of the day, you know, people will see and check whether the quality of air is better or whether we are integrating others in our city to a better degree, and the European Union can only help in that uh, through setting out the right priorities and through helping out in concrete programs. That's why we cooperate with other mayors. That's why I'm looking forward to being in the Committee of the Regions in order to create those networks. We work together. I'm a treasurer of the uh, EuroCities. We also work in the C40 to, to combat climate change. And now the important thing, and with that I will end, is to do lobbying together. Lobbying together when it comes to the uh, final, uh, final uh, legislative proposals, and that's the role of the Committee of Regions, but also, for example, for proposals such as direct access by urban areas and cities to EU funds. Such proposals are on the table, and these are very important, especially when you take into account difficult, and I will use that word wisely, and uh, in a sense it is a euphemism in my case, difficult governments, where we really want to be more progressive, and we need to be able to do common projects with other mayors, with other regions, outside of this uh, national envelope, and demonstrate the added value of acting together, of creating the right networks, in order to influence the priorities, and then translate them into real action. Thank you. Gospodine Markula, program Digitalna Evropa predviđa 9,2 milijarde investicija u razdoblju nakon 2020. u napređivanju međunarodne konkurentnosti i digitalnih kapaciteta Evropske unije. Rekli ste da je ključno pitanje kako program učiniti tako privlačnim da regije i gradovi ubrzaju evropsku digitalnu i ekonomsku transformaciju i povećaju javne i privatne investicije. Što bi trebale kroz ovaj program učiniti lokalne i regionalne uprave kako bi razvile snažan poduzetnički mentalitet i osigurale promjenu, smanjile birokratske prepreke i postale učinkovitije i transparentnije? Um, thank you for the, let's say, challenging question. But uh, let me first say that this is directly linked to the increasing the investments in Europe. But here I don't mean only uh, focusing or investments on infrastructure or, or buildings, but it's, it's investments in 
human capital, intellectual capital, uh, where, uh, let's say, new developments, new innovations are a crucial part. We need to invest in schools and get our younger generation to be really leaders on this digitalization in, uh, digitalization in, in very concrete terms. And here, uh, now looking especially forward uh, for the new commission, uh, one of our good collaborators with regions and cities has always uh, recent years been uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel. And now when she moves from digitalization to education, lifelong learning, innovation, so this is really a good chance to continue. And uh, I've used uh, quite often the example, so what uh, we from um, Helsinki and Finland, what we have been doing with the Sofia and Kabrovo in Bulgaria, so collaborating in concrete terms and learn from this so that the action really is there local. And now with the help of this digital Europe, so we put the strong pressure so that it's this means in one term so that every region in Europe, so around 200 digital innovation hubs will be created in the coming years and we want to speed that up. And these digitalized uh, innovation hubs are what, again, use the Bulgarian experience, what we, or the Tanya Ristova, the mayor of Gabrovo has done, organizing innovation camps, getting local young children, local industry, and other parts of the country and abroad as well to collaborate through these innovation camps, finding the new way for a smaller uh, city as well, uh, re-industrializing the city and focusing very strongly on this human capital. And this is what the digitalization means as well. So we did some mental change, mindset, so that school is not anymore a building, if I use this example. School is more the mentality, the mindset on, on learning. And there we can do a lot. And that's this is how the one way that we uh, work in, in my city and region. And we were very happy, actually, that uh, Finland is not just the happiest country in, in, in the world, beating especially Denmark and other Scandinavian collaborators. But as well, we now, and the uh, latest uh, regional EU scoreboard became the number one region in innovation. And that means that we need to take the responsibility sharing this experience and getting the younger generation, but as well adult senior citizens to collaborate more and share those good solutions. And that's, that's the future, that's the partnerships and communities as we just heard about the Cork or, or, or uh, Warsaw as well. So it needs to operate with the communities of people. Thank you, Marco. Gospodin Ford, Evropski odbor regija omogućuje izabranim regionalnim i lokalnim čelnicima komunicirati i utjecati na evropska pitanja kako bi se pronašla rješenja za mnoge regionalne i lokalne izazove. Uzimajući u obzir mnogobrojne prijetnje demokraciji danas, možete li podijeliti s nama neke ideje o tome kako regionalni i lokalni političari zajedno s evropskim i nacionalnim mogu ojačati povjerenje ljudi u demokratske vrijednosti i u evropski projekt. Koliko će evropska dimenzija biti za vas značajna za vrijeme vašeg mandata? Thank you very much. Um, we're very fortunate in Ireland that a recent poll uh, suggested that 98% of people are in uh, favor of the European project. Um, Alongside of that, another survey was taken, however, to ask people what did they think on the ground that the EU had contributed. And here there was a bit of confusion. They didn't have, uh, they, they didn't have concrete examples, if you like, in their head. So I think we, as local politicians and as regional politicians, we need clear pathways of information from the Committee of the Regions, in the first instance, to our regional assemblies, and to our local authorities with specific benefits. Everybody is aware in Ireland that the EU has been very good in terms of social inclusion, climate action, uh, consumer rights, and so on. The big ticket issues, 
but we need to regionalize the information more, I think, so that local people will know what is being done for their area, because after all, everybody is only concerned with their own agenda. Um, the European uh, project is so important, I think, to ensure that we have trust, democracy in the future. We see all around us global strife, and we what people want more than anything is a certainty that their livelihoods are going to continue, that their peace of mind and their quality of life is going to continue. And by having strong EU policies, which are fed into from the Committee of the Regions and the regional assemblies and local authorities, I think will help to drive that message home. I did a small vox pop before I came out of here of a number of young people uh, that are involved in the periphery of um, politics in Cork. And I asked them the question, I said, what do you think the EU has done locally? And they weren't able to answer me. So therein, I would like to see perhaps a little um, leaflet or uh, some kind of um, missive that will come to the regional assemblies, which can be disseminated to every local authority member, that they in turn can show the very good work, not just by the institutions, but by the backroom people. After all, they don't get mentioned very often out here, but they do tremendous work. And by informing all the local politicians in their towns and communities, they can in turn tell the people and call out those misinformation and those untruths that are being peddled on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have been told that we can uh, take one additional round of questions to our panelists, so I will uh, put it this way uh, to all of three pa participants. Uh, we face in the political life and, of course, in the elections, traditionally left parties and liberals. But lately, we have also to face with the populist, most, mostly far-right parties, how we as central-right party, as Christian Democrat Party, can win the elections against also populist. I think Mr. Tchaikovsky uh, has a recipe. Yes, I would, I would even submit to you that, that there is no uh, clear division anymore between liberal right, right and left, which is that visible. It's more between those uh, parties which are open-minded, progressive, uh, pro-European, and those which are just, you know, uh, uh, inward-looking, uh, actually producing policy based on fear and so on and so forth. The most important thing, and that's why I moved from national politics to local politics, is to be as concrete as possible, because that's what people actually expect. If you're going to tell them about fighting climate change, and you're going to talk about 2040, 2050, and you're going to talk about you know different benchmarking systems and so on and so forth, no one understands that. You just have to translate that into something really concrete. Like, for example, you say, okay, uh, there will be, you know, all the buses will be emission free. And uh, let's look for European support on that. Let's make all our cities, you know, emission free. Uh, and uh, let's uh, use the European funds and let's use the know how to do it. Let's use the technology to do it. For example, smart city technology in order to fight congestion and so on and so forth. So the more concrete you are, the more you can uh, translate those big policy priorities into concrete things that people can actually touch and that they can actually see the difference in two, three, four, five years. And then you can say, yes, this is uh, a program supported by the European Union. For example, like I did with preschools, why not have a program like that in all the uh, European cities? Uh, think about the things that, that people want to really see as change, invest in, in green spaces and so on and so forth. That's what we do in our cities, but uh, maybe we could actually try to use that concrete language and try to transfer that concrete language into the language of the European Union, which always talks about you know, generalities and big priorities and so on and so forth. Let's be as concrete as possible. Please. Um, 
first of all, I, could I mention, I forgot it earlier, that there's a great ability to harness the women's organisations uh, by going out to meet them, because after all, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And I think we have to interact more with women's organisations. Um, I think that people are fed up of tit-for-tat politics. Uh, you said this and he said that. I think you're right. We have to give concrete um, examples of, uh, in, in response to these populist arguments. Um, I think we should uh, write to the media. Uh, you see letters in the media, you know, peddling lies. I think also um, we need to be more brave when taking them on. I think some politicians uh, are afraid to take them on because obviously in social media you could bring uh, a storm down on your head. But I think if it's the truth, we should speak it and have no fear of it. And I think that, you know, every one of us has a responsibility uh, to try and encourage dialogue. We have to hear what they're saying and it's not enough to knock them down. I think we have to counter their arguments in a logical way, and as you say, in a concrete way as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, to add to what my colleagues already said, so uh, that really needs to be very strong on the local level. And uh, there I have a lot of good experience, because in the past, uh, in our city, Espo, the second largest city in Finland, so. Our EPP group, uh, political group, we have not been the largest one, but for uh, the last 20 years we have been, and we are very strong, much, much greater uh, in with the numbers as well compared to our competitors. But that means that we operate their uh, showcase in concrete terms for the citizens, what does that this mean? And we are very strongly pro-European, take this European collaboration and concepts uh, all the time strongly there t into the discussions. Uh, we are very strongly uh, investing in, in education and learning. We just actually yesterday morning uh, got the agreement on next, year, next year's budget with, the, with the, the political groups, all except one accepted that finally under our leadership, and it means as well, so more investments in, in, uh, in uh, schools, more investments in uh, uh, health care and especially the old senior citizens, uh, of course, uh, this equality between men and women. So that has been very long in, uh, in, in our, let's say, priority focus areas with the co uh, concrete results. So it's working with the people and for the people. And I think this is really the only solution. We need to have uh, operate on the all levels, but it's our duty as the EPP parties so that we can really concretely show that what the European value added is, and that is really a big thing. It's not o o talking about generalities, but with the concrete terms, what we can do globally in achieving the, as well, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we take these global issues there as well and operate with uh, schools, with children, with the kindergartens and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Marku. Do we have some uh, questions from other participants to our panelists? Hvala, hvala vama, želim uspehov našim hrvatskim prijateljom i vidimo se v naših županijah i v naših gradah. Hvala. <laughs> you see, it's not so difficult to learn Croatian. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hvala vam lijepa. Evo, mi ćemo samo pričekat da nam se priključe i naši govornici u drugom panelu, pa ćemo nastaviti sa drugim panelom. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Marko. Naši panelisti još uh, trebaju pristić. Kao što znate, kongres obuhvaća brojne sastanke, brojne obveze. Imamo zadovoljstvo da nam i povjereni Khan i drugi naši sugovornici su se odazvali ovom panelu. I evo, očekujemo svaki čas da nam se pridruže, pa ćemo onda završiti i taj dio našeg posla.
Nadam se da ćemo uspjeti uhvatiti ritam sa rokovima za studijski posjet. Tu bih se također zahvalio našem kolegi Željku Turku koji je bio dobar domaćin ovom dijelu IPP obitelji u odboru regija i osigurao nam je studijski posjet i također pomogao u organizaciji večerašnje večere. Evo molim malo strpjenja dok nam se pridruže naši panelisti. Dobro, ipak ćemo krenuti odmah sa drugim panelom. Njega smo nazvali budući proračun Evropske unije ulaganja za građane u partnerstvu s regijama i gradovima. Naši uvaženi sudionici za drugi panel koji ću zamoliti da zauzmu svoja mjesta na pozornici su Johannes Hahn, Evropski povjerenik za proračun i upravu, on će nam se pridružiti svaki minut. A tu su s nama Zikfrit Murešan, član Evropskog parlamenta i podpresjednik skupine Evropske pučke stranke u Evropskom parlamentu, pa ga molim da dođe zauzeti svoje mjesto. Welcome, welcome, please. S nama je također Jan Olbricht, član Evropskog parlamenta, podpredsjednik Skupine Evropske pučke stranke, izvjestitelj u Evropskom parlamentu o višegodišnjem financijskom okviru 21-27. Velkam, Jan. Evo započet ćemo sa gospodinom Urešanom. Član ste Evropskog parlamenta od 2014. godine. Na početku ovoga mandata izabrani ste za podpredsjednika skupine Evropske pučke stranke i preuzeli odgovornost za važnu radnu skupinu za proračun i strukturne politike. Koji su glavni ciljevi skupine Evropske Evropske pučke stranke u pogledu budućeg dugoročnog proračuna, znajući da su regionalne i lokalne vlasti među glavnim korisnicima kohezijskih i poljoprivrednih programa, kako stvoriti bolju sinergiju s drugim EU programima kao što su InvestEU, Horizon Europe, Connecting Europe Facilities, Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all here in this dark room. Um, thank you also for, for taking up the moderation of this session, for the invitation, and for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. You are asking me about the next multi-annual financial framework, 2021-2027, and about the priorities of the EPP group. So firstly, the most important thing which we want to deliver with regards to the EU budget for the next seven years is to adopt it on time. Because the budget of the European Union is always organized in seven year terms, we are now in the framework 2014-2020, and this one started with a delay. And we have to be honest ourselves, the European level, we have a responsibility for this. The budget was adopted late in 2013, and we should avoid repeating this mistake. This is why the European Parliament, under the leadership of Jan Olbricht, who is the Rapporteur of the Parliament for the MFF, we have been ready to negotiate with the Council to discuss with the Commission since November 2018 when our position was adopted. My role as Vice President of the EPP Group 
is to make sure that the EPP priorities, the priorities of the EPP group are reflected in that budget and priority number one is to deliver it on time. Priority number two is to identify the right political um, areas to finance primarily in the budget. Because if we start talking about the figures without firstly agreeing on what the budget should be about, if we start talking about the figures, then the discussions will be very difficult and divisive. You want to pay less, I want to benefit more, and then you know it becomes easily um, as the marketplace. This is why our approach is the following. Firstly, we should agree on what the EU should deliver in the next seven years. And if the answer is the European Union should do more in terms of security, of external border protection, of innovation, of research, should do more to support the mobility of young people in Europe through Erasmus programs and other, should continue to support farmers, cohesion, then if we should do more, we have to be honest to the citizens and say we cannot do much more with much less. And this is why a key principle of our group is fresh priorities require fresh money. If the European Union is expected to do more, if the EU budget is expected to finance more areas, then the budget also needs to increase. And this is why the position of the Parliament, but again, Jan Olbicht is in charge and he knows all the details, is we want the budget to increase to 1.3% of, uh, of the GDP of national member states. And my last point is the following. We need the right balance between old priorities and new priorities. Welcome. If welcome, Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, if something has been a priority in Europe for decades, it doesn't mean that it's outdated, that it's old. On the contrary, it means that it has been a priority for decades because it's important and it continues to be important. And I'm speaking about agriculture and cohesion. So we have new priorities where we will increase significantly our financing. But our approach is the EU budget needs to strike the right balance between the old priorities and the new priorities, which means do not neglect old priorities, do not neglect farmers, do not neglect investments into cohesion, and this is why the position of the Parliament is keep the amounts for cohesion and for agriculture at the same level, do not reduce them. Hvala lijepa. Evo nam se pridružio i treći naš panelista. Želim dobrodošlicu povjereniku Johane Suhanu, zahvaljujem mu na pristanku da sudile u našem panelu, pa ćemo odmah krenuti sa pitanjem za povjerenika Hana. Evropski parlament i Evropski odbor regija u svojim očitovanjima traže da novi EU proračun bude planiran na 1,3% bruto nacionalnog dohodka, stabilnih vlastitih prihoda kako bi se zadržao obujam kohezijske i poljoprivredne politike. Vidimo da se u pregovorima došlo do 1,08% bruto nacionalnog dohodka. Ako bi se takav scenario dogodio, to bi imalo izravan negativan učinak na regije i gradove, budući da znamo da se 60% EU proračuna provodi na regionalnoj i lokalnoj razini. Koja je vaša realna procjena u pogledu veličine budućeg sedmogodišnjeg proračuna i kad bi se proračun mogao usvojiti. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to explain a little bit, but uh, I think um, as I um, uh, occasionally say, the oracle is a European uh, invention many, many ages ago but uh, it's difficult to predict when we will adopt uh, the MFF, but we should do it as soon as possible, exactly f uh, because of uh, structural funds. Uh, Jan Olbricht know it almost better than me, but uh, if we are not, uh, um, so to say, adopt the MFF as soon as possible, everything is delayed, because based on the adoption, we can look into the specific uh, programs, we can, uh, so to say, endow uh, the particular uh, programs with the uh, necessary amount of money. We know exactly how much money is available for which purposes, etc. And this takes time. So the reason uh, why we have currently a delay in the absorption, because uh, 
Nowadays, uh, the absorption for this uh, uh, current program is at around 30% on average. Uh, and this one year before the end of the program uh, is one of the results is uh, the, the late decision last time. Last time we had a decision on the 13th of December 2013 and the new budget came into force on the 1st of January 2014. So it shows what it means, a late delay uh, a, a decision. That's why we have to do it. Second, on the, on the magnitude, I, I have uh, listened uh, a few sentences of uh, Siegfried. I can only subscribe to what he have said. We need a su uh, sufficient uh, amount of money in order to serve all the different uh, needs and interests. And it's not something where the commission is saying um, uh, we need it and, uh, and uh, so to say, out of the blue. But it is based, like it was done also in the parliament, on a bottom-up approach, meaning that we have simply, um, so to say, cast our joint policy into numbers. This is exactly what the budget is, uh, to cast, so to say, our policy, our priorities into numbers. And on the basis of this, uh, of course, we had to anticipate uh, the leave of the UK. The UK is the second biggest um, contributor, uh, and uh, this has to be acknowledged also in budgetary terms, but to a certain extent, and this was exactly the compromise in our draft, this has to be compensated by higher contributions. But again, uh, what we have proposed as a commission already one and a half year ago was the result in figures uh, on basis of decisions taken by heads of states, uh, the council, uh, but also the parliament, and um, looking into, uh, so to say, the future challenges. I remember seven years ago, migration was not yet an issue. Uh, today, it's a big issue. It has to be um, reflected into the budget. The same is challenges uh, uh, local and regional authorities are facing, not only in the area of migration, but also, for instance, demographic changes. This is something which creates a lot of concern. In particular, I understand, for instance, in Croatia, and it's not by chance that uh, the commission nominated by Croatia um, uh, is dealing with the demographic change which is in almost half of the countries of the European Union an issue. And these are all elements which have to be echoed in a way in the budget in order to address it probably and finally to serve European interests to create the European added value which only is achievable if we look from a European perspective on certain issues. Thank you, Commissioner Hahn. Mr. Albrecht. Kao bivši gradonačelnik i predsjednik regije i kao član Evropskog parlamenta od 2004. te kao izvjestitelj za višegodišnji financijski okvir 2021-2027. dobro poznajete potrebe regionalne i lokalne samouprave. Kada vi očekujete usvajanje višegodišnjeg EU proračuna i kako će, odnosno kako bi po vama trebao izgledati? Yes, uh, for first of all, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation for this event, uh, which is for the EPV, is so, so important, why? Uh, l but l let me give some additional remarks which are important, especially during the Congress of EPP. Uh, we need inside the EPP party, like we need it inside the EPP group, a serious debate, a very serious debate, what we expect from European Union what we expect from European Union in future, what, how we would like to achieve it, what should be done in next years in each member state, because budget is only part of the problem. I can give you an example. I am in a very close contact, there are here in the room also the people from the local and regional authorities in Poland, because we have now facing the prob process of recentralizing of power, more charging on the local and regional authorities of taxes, of everything, Local and regional authorities, they will have less and less money for co-financing investment from EU. So that's why when we discuss in Poland about the next MFF, it's not only how much money we will have in the European budget. The question is how much money will the local and regional authorities have to co-finance 
the, the European investment. So I think we should look very carefully uh, uh, in our member states what is going on, because maybe the, the local and the regional authorities will be excluded from the process, not because of you, but because of the national, national situation. Second, we have to be very careful, because what Siegfried said, please do not uh, uh, forget that inside our group we have the colleagues who are against the budget inside the EPP. We have to have a very serious debate because our colleagues from Sweden, Denmark, <laughs> Netherlands, they are against the, our thinking about our, uh, the budget. And this is inside the EPP because they, 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 these people, they want to uh, react to the demands from the voters in their countries. It's not that I would like to criticize them, but we need a very serious debate inside the EPP because we have to be united. Because if we are not united, it will be extremely difficult in coming months. Because we would like to support, for example, the Commission to fight for the good budget. But we have to be united. It cannot be split into the national, na national level. And of course, what now? What, what is going on? When I expect the, uh, mm, the, the budget to, to be accepted, let's be very concrete. For the local and the digital authorities, it's not important when the MFF will be accepted. The question is when the regulation concerning cohesion policy, transport, etc., will be ready, and when they start the operational programs. This is the, the this is the information. So, of course, the sectorial um, uh, regulation can be uh, finished only if we have budget. When we will have budget, my private opinion, uh, private, I mean relatively private as a rapporteur, is optimist optim optimistic version is that the uh, there will be the, the um, decision in March April which will open the final elements of regulation. This is very optimistic. But what is the average opinion among the member states, and including uh, the uh, parliament? We have just had the, the meetings yesterday. This is that it will not be before the German presidency. So we mean the second half of the year. Second half of the year, it means that everything will be late at least, what the, what the commission said, at least one year, maybe two. Because we have also the, the, the problem of implementation of the policies in the last year. I, I, if it's now 30%, so at the end of 2020 will be 50 or 60. So we will have 40% to be paid from the new perspective. So this is a very pessimistic view is that we will not be ready before the end of 2020. And that's why we ask the Commission to think about the possible exit strategy to give the information for local authorities, universities, SMEs, what will happen if we don't have the, the, the budget. Why we cannot have budget? For two reasons. One is extremely important. The member states cannot find the agreement among themselves. And this is the reality today. They cannot find the agreement. But even if they find the agreement, and the agreement will go not along the expectation from the European Parliament, and in this Parliament they are the same political parties which are in the governments. They are the same, and the, uh, the opposition. So if, we, if the Parliament doesn't accept it, we will say no to the budget. So everything will be postponed. We would like to avoid it. That's why just two days ago we proposed uh, the Croatian presidency uh, to work very closely. I mean, Commission, Presidency, and us. We would like to avoid the problem, but we have to be very close. What is the expectation from the local authorities, what you ask me? It's not the information about the, our negotiation. The local authorities, they don't need it. They need a very clear information. What we will be able to use money for? I mean, and this is the result, what um, Zygmunt said, our priorities. What we will be ready to pay, and be sure there will be some elements which will be for sure more or less in, in the coming years. First is climate. Climate will be absolutely dominating everything. The question is how we will define it. This, and the second, of course, is question of security and the uh, border protection, etc. So this is, I mean, climate, uh, uh, of course, digitalization is obvious. This is something, the, the sign of time. So uh, 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 just to summarize, I don't expect very quickly, but the local authorities cannot wait. And I would just ask the members of the Committee of Regions, please be active now with us, with the Commission, and with the governments, because we have no time to lose. It will be the common fight, uh, and but for this we, we, uh, we need unity. This is the time to fight, because, because almost everything can be changed now. In coming months, no. Thank you, Mr. Albrecht.
The second round, we shall uh, start with the Commissioner Hahn. But before, I would like uh, to invite you to greet warmly Mrs. Helen McIntyre, the Minister of European Affairs of Ireland. <laughs> Welcome. Evropski proračun je instrument za regionalne i lokalne političare Evropske pučke stranke koji mogu dokazati da EU daje vidljive rezultate za svoje građane. Regionalna i lokalna samouprava su ključni partneri u pripremi, upravljanju i provedbi kohezijskih projekata. Svjedoci smo da se sve više projektima upravlja s evropske i nacionalne razine a ne s regionalne i lokalne. Povjereniče Han, vi ponajbolje poznajete regionalnu politiku, jednako tako proračun. Možete li nam dati neke primjere o tome kako bolje surađivati s komisijom, kako bi se povećali učinkovitost i dodanu vrijednost EU proračuna na terenu? Mislite li da načelo partnerstva još inspirira nositelje odluka u Briselu i u nacionalnim glavnim gradovima. Well, um, following what uh, Jan has said, um, uh, first of course we need the budget and then we can look into the sectoral regulations and everything and based on this we can work on the programs. What I can only ask you, urge you, but I think it's already, so to say, um, on the way, is to prepare everything for the time when the regulations are there. And to prepare everything is to be uh, clear what are so the, the specific interests of uh, regions based on the information provided by the different uh, local authorities. I think this should be also an issue, cooperation between local authorities and regional authorities, and this should feed into the, so to say, national uh, uh, programs, because at the end of the day, as a commission, we have to negotiate with the national representatives. But our understanding is that the national representatives are, so to say, are in constant contact with the regional and local authorities. And may I say, I remember the time when I was uh, commissioner, it's not only that everything um, so to say ends up at the regional level. No, there should be also the inclusion of the local authorities. It should be a joint effort of everybody. And then we know the different, uh, so to say, European priorities. Um, uh, so to say, climate change, innovation, promotion of the economy, that's why, for instance, we have proposed last time and now we have to build on this experience smart specialization for each region, which means to focus on the strength of a given region based on the different, so to say, uh, opportunities and possibilities of the, local er of the different local areas in a given um, region. It's about uh, a national-wide transport strategy, which is again the result of the different regional elements and the same is for uh, innovation, is for investment in, in, in people, etc. And in particular, everything should ideally be related uh, to reach our climate goals. It's about an intelligent, smart, um, so to say, uh, coupling of different goals, which I think is achievable, but it should be understood we are working together on European goals. That's why we have always pushed to have a regional policy which uh, is uh, for all European regions. Of course, we have to differentiate between more developed, less developed, and in between transition regions. But in order to pursue and to, so to say, achieve European goals, we need uh, the participation of all the 200 uh, 76 regions, if I'm right in mind, uh, in order to get where we want to be. But in terms of concrete project, it's about, uh, so to say, an individual tailor-made approach, bottom-up, uh, uh, provided by the local authorities, feed into the regional concept, and this, again, 
should uh, feed into a national program respecting the European goals. This would be, in an ideal world, the programming exercise I would like to see. Zahvaljem povjereniku Hanu. Gospodine Murašan, vi ste bili glavni pregovarač ispred Evropskog parlamenta za godišnji EU proračun i u tom svojstvu imali ste ključnu riječ o tome na kojim područjima bi EU trebala trošiti svoj proračun. Koja je uloga regionalnih i lokalnih vlasti u prevođenju Evropskog proračuna i prioriteta u konkretne opipljive rezultate na terenu? Što u tom smislu može obitelj Evropske pučke stranke konkretno učiniti kako bi se povećala vidljivost i dodana vrijednost EU proračuna na evropskoj, nacionalnoj, regionalnoj i lokalnoj razini? So I was, I was indeed the um, general rapporteur for of the European Parliament for the EU budget of 2018. And then, with a large majority in Parliament, we have identified security and jobs as the top priorities for that year. We felt that that was, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, following the migration and refugee crisis, we felt that was what the citizens of Europe expected then, security in every corner of Europe. That is why we decided to raise our game in terms of border protection, in terms of better cooperation of our justice, home affairs, agencies, institutions, in order to better identify uh, people who are suspects um, of um, human trafficking, of arms trafficking, of, uh, of uh, terrorism, um, of drug drugs trafficking. Um, so security at the external border at, as a key component in order to be able to travel freely and safely all over Europe, to be able to invest safely in all regions in Europe. And of course jobs, the uh, perspective of people for prosperity within the European Union, which we believe was based on research, innovation. So we said in order to be able to secure prosperity in Europe, we have to be better, we have to continue improving. This is why we invested a lot in Horizon 2020, research, innovation, infrastructure, um, large infrastructure programs supporting SMEs, particularly innovative SMEs. All of this uh, in addition to, of course, the traditional priorities of the budget cohesion and agriculture. Um, now, two years later, of course, uh, Jan has mentioned it very well, priorities evolve. We evolve as individuals, Europe evolves, priorities have also evolved. Climate, digitalization, new forms of mobility are expectations of the people which we need to fulfill. Um, but I want to be very open with you. Um, we have to do, in the next three, four years, up to the end of 2023, the following three things, and we only can do them together with local elected officials. Firstly, we have to conclude the MFF 2014-2020, where uh, beneficiaries are allowed to absorb EU funds until the 31st of December 2023. Commissioner Hahn has said it very well, only about 30% of the money allocated for these seven years have already been disbursed, and six out of seven years have passed. In my country, for example, where we have excellent mayors, EU funds are absorbed, but at governmental level, we had a socialist government until three weeks ago, um, we're lagging behind. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is make sure that all of the money for 2014, 2020 reaches the beneficiaries. We have to finish this job by 2023. The, the second thing that we have to do is um, agree on the MFF for the next seven years, as was said before by all three of us, and it's very good that we agree, um, without any delays. So we start to abs we need to start absorbing money on the new MFF as soon as possible in 2021. And we need to do this because we have new priorities. The current MFF was decided in 2013. Many things have passed since, have happened since, and this MFF had to do things which were not anticipated. It was stretched to its very limit we had to create the Juncker investment plan. We prolonged it because it's a very good project. We also created an investment plan for Africa, a Madad fund for Syrian refugees, a Turkey refugee facility two times financed through the EU budget. 
an another Africa fund. So we had to do many things in these seven years which were not anticipated in 2013 when the budget was decided and which pushed the budget to its limit. In order to be able to finance our new priorities, we need the new MFF in place. And thirdly, we need to decide the rules uh, for the next um, MFF in a way in which uh, it helps uh, beneficiaries, in a way in which it makes sense for you. Less bureaucracy, a common sense of uh, a common a common set of rules and provisions for all EU member states based on best practices, and you know the best practices better than we know them. Um, based on best practices, uh, digitalization, digital archives, and so on, make it easy, simple, and cheap for beneficiaries to access EU funds. And to conclude, and here I want to be very frank, I want to say the following: Whenever we are in a budget negotiation. It is us, the Parliament, who firstly needs to push the member states to finance the EU budget properly. It's always a push. They always insist on less, you know, and how bad this is, just look at David Cameron. He was the one who in two 2013 insisted on a small EU budget, you know, fueling this type of Euroscepticism. Look where the United Kingdom is now. This is a very bad thing. So we have to push member states to finance the EU budget accordingly, to put their money where their statements are. Because they always say, yes, we want more security, uh, more border security from the EU budget. But are you ready to pay more into the EU budget? Well, let's see, not a penny more and so on. Let's see if we can squeeze the lemon somewhere else. So what I want to say is member states need to put their money where the statements are. If we agree that something is important for Europe, we need to finance it. Then the second thing that we have to push member states about is to start absorbing the EU money without any delay. 2014-15 there were delays. As I said in the beginning, we were partly to be blamed for it because we adopted legislation late in 2013, but in my country, in Romania, out of the 10 management authorities, the institutions uh, who make the payments, in 2017, in April, we only had accredited two out of 10. Uh, so there you see where the bigger source of delay is. And the third thing that we have to push member states for, so secondly, we have to push them to absorb money, and thirdly is, you know, at the end of, uh, of the MFF to pay the bills. Uh, when the absorption capacity is high, when uh, all projects reach cruising speed, then the needs, financial needs on the ground are big, and then we also need to pay what we have committed for because there is no worse signal than the European Union sends to beneficiaries, to the private sector, to NGOs, to mayors, or to citizens than a European Union not capable of paying its bills on time. Thank you, Siegfried. Mr. Olbright, can you say, as a member of the European Pučke Stranke, how can the family of the Pučke Stranke increase the visibility and added value of the European budget on the European, national, regional and local level. Sorry, I didn't uh, get the machine that works, so if repeat. you can just repeat in English, please. Uh, možete li reći, kao podpredsjednik skupine Evropske pučke stranke, you hear me? Uh, možete li reći, kao podpredsjednik skupine Evropske pučke stranke, kako može obitelj Evropske pučke stranke povećati vidljivost i dodanu vrijednost Evropskog proračuna na Evropskoj nacionalnoj, regionalnoj i lokalnoj razini? How to increase uh, the visibility of uh, European uh, budget on European national, regional, local level? Yes, uh, if, if you allow me, I would just to add something what uh, Commissioner Hahn said, and next I will answer your question. Uh, uh, for the local and regional authorities, it, it is, is not, uh, le uh, it's not uh, uh, unimportant who is commissioner, to be, to be very frank. Because uh, I remember the time when Johannes Hahn was the, uh, uh, the commissioner for regional policy, and I know the time after uh, and for example, the, uh, uh, for, for local and regional authorities, I, 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 what is important is the consequence of our decision. 
And so it's very clear that very often in the European Commission we can hear that uh, distribution of money and the division of competences in the member states is up to the member states, full stop. It's not the problem of the Commission. At the same time, at the same time, the Commission is able to introduce the legislation which can influence positively or negatively the question of decentralization and the uh, partnership of local authorities. Let me give you the example. I mean, the colleagues from the Committee of Regions, they know very well, because there is a position of the Committee of Regions about the thematic concentration. Thematic concentration is the idea from last two years, so it was not your time of the Commission. And, uh, 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 and this is very clear, that the decision of the uh, thematic concentration belongs to the government and not to the local and regional authorities. So we, uh, we ask the Commission, why you are you doing it? You say, because this is the problem of member states. No. In the legislation, you decide about the centralization. You, re you reinforce the centralization. You have to reinforce the decentralization. So that's why when you ask me about the, about the, uh, about the uh, visibility, the visibility, the question of what is visibility, I, with Siegfried, we used to have uh, the, the French liberal as the president of the uh, budget committee. And uh, five years he was always repeating, we have to do everything that the budget will be visible for the citizens. And I think that you, I mean the mayors and the president of regions, you know very well that the citizens are going in the streets and they are just thinking about the construction of European budget. This is absolutely fascinating uh, uh, the job to th think about European budget. They don't care. This is not their problem. The problem if they understand European budget. No. Do they understand the national budget? No. Do they understand the uh, uh, local budget? No. But this is not their problem. This is the not the problem of the please. citizens to understand the budget. The problem is uh, they understand the consequence of the budget. I mean, what will the question which will be asked by the citizens, okay, will we be safe or not? We will have the clear air or not. Are you ready to, to guarantee money for it? Um, this is the question the people, they ask. Okay, are you able to guarantee that it will be done? It means that you have to have uh, uh, financial resources either in the national budget or in European budget. If we are not able to guarantee that it will be done, so the vi the, this budget is not visible. I mean, for the, for the members, what, I mean for the citizens, what it really means 1.3, 1.00, etc. Um, this is completely useless. The, the question is, uh, what we are speaking all the time, we will not achieve the goals of European Union. We will not do what we, pr what we promise to the people. We promise to the people the European Union will have to do it. And next we will not guarantee money, so we will not do it. And the people will be completely frustrated. So they will ask, what is the European Union for? So that's why when we ask the government, okay, you, are, you agree, this is the international organization, you agree of, s for example, 10 uh, challenges. You agree? Yes. You have the agreement, unanimity? Yes. Do you guarantee the money? No. So please tell it to the people. Tell it to the people. Our role as EPP, as EPP, we have to be very clear, visible, and we have to tell the truth. The Congress in Zagreb is not the Congress of Europeans. The Congress in Zagreb is a Congress of EPP. We should be very clear what we want from European Union and not to make the race who is more green than the Greens, which is today the problem of French. I mean, the French Renaissance, they are making the race who is more green. This is not our problem. The problem is cl uh, clear, I mean, uh, 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 air, good transport, etc. So I think the only way to make a budget visible is to be concrete, what has been said before, and to tell the people the truth. I mean, I if we don't have money, okay, let's tell the people there will be no money for doing it, and it should be clear, especially for the local authorities, because they, they are facing the citizens, and the people say, we will have European money or not. So I think that the only way is to, to, to be transparent and do to fight for our priorities and to ask our governments, if we are in the government, which is not the case in my country, and ask our commissioners, our commissioners also, to, to have the EPP way of thinking and to work very closely among us. We have to work very closely, EPP people in the Commission, in the Council, in the Parliament, in the political party, together, and, because and to support each other. We are ready to support Commissioner Hahn, because he will have extreme, last sentence, 
Me as a rapporteur of, of MFF, it's like the rapporteur uh, 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 Siegfried uh, uh, before. The natural tendency is to attack the commission. Attack the commission, you are not doing what the we expect. But I know the commissioner is from the EPP. So if I want to criticize the commission, I will not attack the commissioner because this I would not destroy because I want him to be strong. So this is, I think, a political issue, and we have to be very careful. We are politicians. We are not technicians. Thank you. Hvala, Jan. Our uh, last question goes to uh, Commissioner Hahn, and he can also, of course, comment uh, previous said. Uh, predsjednica Ursula von der Leyen ustvrdila je u svojim političkim smjernicama demokratski sustav naše unije je jedinstven okupljajući izravno izabrane predstavnike na lokalnoj, regionalnoj, nacionalnoj i evropskoj razini s izabranim čelnicima država i vlada. Kako namjeravate ovu izjavu prevesti u izvore potrebne za uredno djelovanje Evro Evropskog parlamenta i posebno Evropskog odbora regija kao dvije institucije s izravno izabranim članovima. Well, thank you for the question because it fits to a certain extent in what I wanted to, to comment on um, Jan uh, um, uh, remarks, but first I wanted to say I really appreciate the way how we are working together, but you should not believe that uh, they are not critical to what we are doing, but it's, it's, it's something different if you tell it to me in a private conversation or if you use a, a public forum. And, and this is something where we should be aware in, 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 in terms of uh, political, uh, so to say, debate and having in mind, so to say, that we are one family trying to achieve the same. Of course, we have different roles, but it's a question of, uh, so to say, mutual um, understanding and um, respect how to exchange and how to sort out if we have different views on something, which is actually in very many, uh, very often uh, very natural. Here is a member of the parliament, here is somebody from the executive side, but we have to find at the end of the day so to say, a common denominator, and this is possible if it's um, a, a solid, a frank, open, but clear and friendly exchange. But what I wanted to say, and this, um, uh, so to say, leads to your question, um, I wanted, I would like to make the following proposal. I just discovered, because in my, in my country, Austria, we have something which one could say is still a project, almost, I would say, it's an institution, and this is that we have launched a couple of years ago um, the idea and started to implement that at the level of each municipality where we have a local parliament, there are different names for it, but there is a kind of representation and there are deputies. So each municipality should nominate one deputy to be the so-called EU deputy of this uh, entity. And in Austria, we have more than 2,000 municipalities. In the meantime, we have more than 1,000 uh, local EU uh, deputies. And they are, so to say, in a constant contact, in particular with our EU representation. They receive direct informations. They have the ability, they have the informations, and they do so and they communicate to their people, not only in the, so to say, local parliament but also in their constituency and this makes it possible to uh, so to say uh, translate European issues sometimes very abstract into some very concrete examples proposals and on the other hand get the feedback and my proposal is now to extend this project all over Europe I mean we have probably ten thousands of municipalities if we would have in each municipality, so to say, a, a defined and, a, 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 so to say, nominated, assigned deputy who can serve as our contact point, I think we could tremendously improve the level of uh, exchange of information, of feedback in one or the other direction and can contribute to a better understanding better performance 
but better so to say also feedback from the local level even to the European level about what is Europe and what is the individual added value for each citizen if it is explained by his direct so to say deputies. I think this would have a huge impact on uh, the acceptance but also the understanding of the work of uh, the European Union and please um, reflect about this, consider this. I think it could be a very important um, uh, project of uh, the Committee of the Region to inject uh, this idea and to translate it into concrete results. Thank you very much. Hvala povjereniku Hanu. Mi možemo samo toplo pozdraviti ovaj poziv koji smo čuli, dakle način kako se lokalne regionalne vlasti mogu najbolje uključiti u evropske poslove, evropske politike i tu doista držim vrijednom iskustvo koje ima pučka stranka u Austriji. Time završavamo ovaj naš panel. Ja se zahvaljujem svim panelistima. Doista su prilozi bili inspirativni, bili su konstruktivni, bili su dobri i evo time završavamo ovaj panel. Ja ću još samo iznijeti par zaključnih napomena i onda ćemo ići dalje u programu na studijski posjet. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Ne moramo nam samo počitati ovo malo. Reci, reci samo da moram ja ovo. Da, da. Evo još samo par zaključnih napomena Dakle, u vezi sa radom ovoga panela, mi smo i na ovom lokalnom dijalogu potvrdili da su regije, gradovi i općine nenadomjestive sastavnice ustroja Evropske unije najbliže građanima, kojima građani najviše vjeruju i gdje su učinci EU politika najbolje vidljivi. Regije, gradovi i općine trebaju biti partneri ostalim tijelima Evropske unije, ne samo u provedbi, nego i u kreiranju evropskih politika. Trebamo svi pojačati kontakte s našim građanima, posebno kroz dijalog s njima na regionalnoj i lokalnoj razini diljem Evropske unije. Nadamo se što skorijem usvajanju višegodišnjeg finanskog okvira očekujemo da konačna verzija višegodišnjeg finanskog okvira, uvaži stavove odbora regija i ne smanjuje izdvajanja za kohezijsku i zajedničku poljoprivrednu politiku, ne pogoršava uvjete predfinansiranja, sufinansiranja i rokova provođenja projekata, jer bi to pogodilo upravo lokalnu i regionalnu samoupravu. Razumijemo i podržavamo predloženo povećavanje sredstava za osiguravanje konkurentnosti s rastućim gospodarskim silama u svijetu, za istraživanja i inovacije, za mlade, za odgovore na nove izazove kao što su sigurnost, obrana, granice, migracije, ali ne na uštrb kohezijske i zajedničke poljoprivredne politike. To su temeljne evropske politike i EU bez tih politika neće ispuniti svoju misiju. Stoga još jednom poziv za povećanje vlastitih prihoda na 1,3% bruto nacionalnog dohodka. Hvala svima na ovom uspješnom dijalogu i pozivam da se sa dobrovoljcima koji će nas odvesti do autobusa uputimo ka autobusima i za studijski posjet Zaprešiću i tvornici u Zaprešiću. Hvala vam. Just a short announcement. Please, those who need to collect your clothes, go back to the first floor where you left them, collect your clothes and come